ബിസ്മില്ലാ <tries> Bismillah ta'ala we'll begin with lesson 9 today lesson 10 the majority of it was covered last friday and so tomorrow inshallah i want to cover whatever was remaining from lesson 10 and a few miscellaneous rulings pertaining to jamaa because that's not something that's covered in much detail in this text but before getting into lesson number 9 I would like to answer the question that was asked at the end of yesterday's lesson which was that how could somebody do tashahhud four times in a salah that has three rak'ahs such as maghrib and many people have already approached with their particular answers but the correct answer or one of the correct answers that is if a person was to join the maghrib jama'ah before the third rak'ah but missing the second So for example they missed the ruku of the second rak'ah and they joined so they joined either in the sajda of the second rak'ah or in the tashahhud the first tashahhud which takes place that would be the first they would then stand for the third rak'ah with the congregation after that rak'ah there would be a second tashahhud for that person then the person would get up and make up his first rak'ah that he missed but in reality he will have now completed two rak'ahs the third one which is the one that he caught and the first one he missed this is three tashahhud and then the fourth one would be after he completes his third rak'ah so this is a prayer with three rak'at but he did the tashahhud four times so that was the answer to the question that was asked at the end of yesterday's class today we're looking at the nullifications or the nullifiers of prayer and not many are mentioned there's about two pages worth or a page and a half in some of the classic works of fiqh many more things which nullify the prayer are mentioned in nur al idah for example one of the most famous classical texts of fiqh around 70 68 70 nullifications of prayer are mentioned but the author for this text mentions the main ones number one that is speaking forgetfully or by mistake and this is mentioned in dur al muhtar that whether a person speaks intentionally in the prayer or unintentionally sometimes a person is extremely accustomed to saying wa alaykum salam or when somebody sneezes saying uh, yarhamukullah for example accidental deliberate forgetfully doesn't matter in the hanafi school speech will invalidate the prayer imam ash-shafi rahimahullah ta'ala he disagreed He said that if it was done accidentally or it wasn't intentional then this would not invalidate the prayer but within our school forgetful mis- mistaken or deliberate in all these circumstances speech will invalidate the prayer number 2 supplication dua which resembles the words of worldly speech we mentioned yesterday that you cannot do dua inside the prayer in any language other than arabic and if it resembles the human speech in any way shape or form this invalidates the prayer straight away this was mentioned yesterday the third thing that breaks the salah that is excessive movement a concept known as amal kathir amal means movement movement or action and then it can be kathir or it can be qalil it can be excessive or more or it could be qalil which means less less movement doesn't invalidate the prayer more movement does amal kathir that invalidates the prayer there's two particular ways of defining amal kathir number one that is that if a person or an onlooker was to be watching you pray if they were to think that you are not praying because of what you are doing so if you're doing movements inside your prayer such that if there was an onlooker 
and that onlooker was watching and would think you are not in your prayer, this is one definition of amal kathir. And in some of the books of fatwa, some of the books of fatawa, for example, Durr Muhtar, it mentions in there that if a person was to be seen by an onlooker, but the onlooker thinks he might be praying or he might not be, this is not enough for an action to be considered amal kathir. For it to be amal kathir, the onlooker must be quite certain that you were not in prayer because of the movements that you were making. This is the first definition of amal kathir. The second definition of amal kathir, which the ulama have given, that is if a person was to do three continuous movements, three continuous movements, this is according to one definition, amal kathir. And so sometimes a person feels itchy, they need to scratch something like this, they say, that scratch, but don't do more than two movements and then stop. And in one rak'ah, a person is allowed up to three amal kalils, if that makes sense. So three minor movements per rak'ah is excusable. And so they say that if you need to scratch, scratch using two movements and then put the hand back down. And you can do this two more times. And then if you do it three times, this would now equate to Amale kathir, excessive movement which breaks the salah. This is one example and of course according to the other definition that would be if somebody was unlooking and they were pretty certain you're not praying, this is amale kathir that would break the salah. The third thing that is turning the chest away from qibla. Why does this break the salah? Because istiqbalul qibla is from the preconditions of prayer. So if a person was to deliberately turn the chest away from the direction of Qibla, this would break the Salah, if done deliberately. If it was accidental, then they say that if it was accidentally moved for the time it takes to do Tasbih, then um, if it's within that time, the prayer does not break. And if it was for longer than the time it takes to do a Tasbih, then that would invalidate the entire prayer. Why? Because it's a precondition of the prayer to be facing the Qibla. When it comes to the face, Turning the face away from direction of Qibla does not invalidate the prayer. But it's mustahab when in Qiyam to be uh, looking downwards at the place of prostration. Why? Because the Prophet wasallam said that the musalli, the person who is praying, as long as that person is praying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is attentive towards that person. For as long as he is not looking side to side, when that person starts looking side to side, becoming inattentive, then the attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy will also leave that individual. This is a hadith which states the importance of not looking side to side, even though the face facing Qibla is not from the preconditions. Many hadith and many ulama, they speak about the importance of not looking side to side with the face in salah. But turning the chest away from Qibla deliberately, this would invalidate the Salah. Eating and drinking. The prayer is not void if a person eats something that was left in between the teeth smaller than the size of a chickpea. And this is the same with your fast. If a person had food in the mouth from before the prayer, they ate and then they rushed to, to the mosque to pray or time was short or for whatever reason, they still had particles of food remaining in between the teeth. If you were to equate all them pieces of food that are stuck in between the teeth and they were less than the size of a chickpea, then if you were to swallow them during the prayer, the prayer would not invalidate. If it was to equate to more than the size of a, size of a chickpea or it was to come from an external source, meaning it fell into the mouth. Or for example, if you're praying outside and rain came into the mouth, to swallow this would invalidate the prayer straight away. It's the same with the fast. If you close your fast and after the time for Fajr has begun, you can now no longer eat or drink. But food particles remained in between the teeth such that if you were to equate them, they were less than the size of a chickpea. If you were to swallow these particles of food, it would not invalidate the fast. If on the other hand, they came from an external source, even if that external source, if, even if it was only to amount to the size of a sesame seed, this would break the fast, if it was from an external source. Similarly, if the food inside the mouth remained in the time for Fajr began, 
and that equated to more than the size of a chickpea, then swallowing this would break the fast. When we say that food up to the size of a chickpea can be swallowed if it was already inside the mouth and it would not invalidate the fast, this doesn't mean you should swallow the food. It means that if it was accidentally swallowed, it would not invalidate the fast. But the point is that eating and drinking invalidates the prayer. To clear the throat without valid reason, to make unnecessary sounds, it is permissible to clear the throat for recitation. And this is a big one. You will notice in congregation, almost every time one person makes the sound of a cough or clears the throat, a whole host of people will all start clearing their throat. This happens if you make unnecessary sound inside the prayer or you cough and clear the throat for no reason, meaning it wasn't out of reflex, there was nothing stuck in the throat, there was no need for you to clear the throat and make that noise, this would invalidate the prayer straight away. And this is something we need to be careful of because sometimes when we hear somebody clearing the throat without even thinking, we start making that noise. This invalidates the prayer according to the Hanafi school of fiqh. The next one, to reply to somebody sneezing, this is something we've already mentioned. To respond to bad news or good news with Alhamdulillah or Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilayhi Raji'oon. Now, this particular phrase, Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilayhi Raji'oon, generally, you use it when you've lost something or when a person passes away and so on and so forth. And so I just want to mention the mas'ala regarding crying in the prayer. If a person is crying because of the meaning of the words, or because of khushu, or because they are thinking of hellfire or paradise, this would not invalidate the prayer. But if a person is praying an obligatory prayer, and they're crying because they've lost a relative or a friend or something like this, then if sound was to come from this crying, this too would invalidate the prayer, according to the majority of Hanafi jurists. And this is something which is mentioned in the books of fiqh. If you are crying due to the loss of a relative or due to something else worldly related, if a sound comes out, then this is deemed as unnecessary sound and it breaks the prayer. On the other hand, if you're crying because of the meaning of the ayat or the words of Quran al karim or because of khushu or similar reasons, then the prayer is still intact. If a person is in the state of tayammum and gains access to water and is capable of using it, then the prayer breaks. Why? Because it's a precondition of prayer that a person is in the state of wudu. And tayammum is there as a replacement for wudu, as alhamdulillah we covered in a decent amount of detail. If water becomes available to an individual whilst they are praying, then as soon as that water becomes available, the tayammum breaks, a person is no longer in a state of um, ritual impurity and a person needs to go and make that wudu. And so because there's no longer wudu, that, uh, that equates to the prayer becoming invalid. And the same applies to mash upon the khufain. If a person did mash over the khufain as a resident, just for example, and the 24 hours elapse in the middle of your prayer, in the middle of your prayer, that 24 hours elapses, then that mash is invalidated and a person needs to wash the feet. Therefore, even if a person is in the middle of prayer, that prayer breaks, the person needs to go and fulfill the washing of the feet and then a person can continue uh, with the prayer. Fainting or becoming insane, why? Because that breaks the wudu. So if you, again, wudu breaks, the salah breaks too. Breaking wudu, that's an obvious one. To help anyone other than his own Imam in recitation of the Quran during prayer invalidates the prayer. In one hadith of Sayyidina Imam Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, it's mentioned that if the Imam becomes hungry, then feed him. And this point, again, it shows the importance of having a teacher. If the Imam becomes hungry, feed him. It doesn't mean that if the Imam needs food, then give him food. It means that if the Imam has forgotten what he was reciting or needs somebody to help out with the recitation, then help that Imam. So we see from this hadith, and different different narrations, the permissibility of helping your own Imam in prayer. If you're helping somebody outside of that prayer, this would invalidate the prayer. If the first Hamza in Allahu Akbar is stretched such that a person reads Allahu Akbar, this can invalidate the prayer. 
this mainly applies to this takbir tahrima. Why? Because some of the other takbirat, for example, we learned yesterday, for example, just one of the takbir, the takbir from qiyam going into ruku is a sunnah. And so if a person missed it out habitually, it would be sinful. A person should act upon every sunnah, but if it was accidentally missed, there would be no need for a sajda to sahav. It would not invalidate the prayer. Rather, a person would just be derived or deprived, sorry, from the reward of fulfilling a sunnah. However, if it's for one of the wajib takbirat or for a fard takbir, like the takbir tahrima, then to pronounce it incorrectly such that the meaning is changed, this would invalidate the prayer. In the case of takbir tahrima, the prayer wouldn't even start. Why? Because it's also from the preconditions of prayer. So if the preconditions are not met, how can the prayer have started in the first place? If it's for one of the wajib takbirat, like the takbir of um, kunut, or the takbirat which are added or additional in the Eid prayer, then this would invalidate the prayer. Or if done accidentally, it would necessitate the uh, sajda to sahav. Reciting Quran that is not memorized during salah. If a person is reciting an ayah which they know of by heart and they are reciting of by heart, but that ayah happens to be in front of them and they're looking at it, this would depend. If a person is taking inspiration from what is written in front of them, this would break the prayer. If they are just looking at it, but they are not using it to recite, they know it off by heart, this would not invalidate the prayer. Just to add to this, sometimes in certain masajid, there are posters on the wall in the direction you're facing. In certain masajid, there's TVs on the wall in the direction you're facing. Sometimes you're not even praying in a masjid, you're praying at work or something, there's posters around. A person must be extremely careful, number one. This would apply when you're outside the masjid. If there's pictures of animate objects around you, pictures of animals, pictures of humans, person must be extremely careful. To pray in such an environment is impermissible. This is the first thing. Second thing that is, that if you are comprehending what's written on the wall, this is makruh. This is disliked. If it's in a masjid, for example, a hadith is written on the wall with translation, or an announcement is written, if you're looking at that and comprehending it, taking it in, during your salah, it is disliked. It doesn't invalidate the prayer, but it's disliked. And if you're comprehending something which isn't related to the deen, the ulama mentioned that the level of dislikedness is even higher. But the point here is that reciting Quran which is not memorized during salah, this breaks the prayer. This invalidates the prayer. Reading from a mushaf whilst knowing it by memory as well, Imam Abu Hanifa considered this to nullify the prayer whilst the sahibain considered the prayer to remain valid. Sahibain refers to Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad. The second and third most big or they are second and third in terms of authority within the Hanafi school. The two main students of Imam Abu Hanifa. They held the opinion that if you are holding the Mus'haf just as a backup, but you're not actually reciting from it, your prayer would be valid. But Imam Abu Hanifa and this is the opinion that the ulama tend to stick to, that is, that even holding the mushaf or looking at it uh, for inspiration, this invalidates the prayer. Exposure of awrah which is non-excusable for the amount of time it is taken to perform an integral of prayer. What is this amount of time? However long it takes you to say, tasbih, subhanallah. The same applies if clothes or the body become soiled with an impurity. And this is something which we covered in decent detail already, alhamdulillah, during the preconditions of prayer. So I won't expand on it too much. Performing a pillar of the prayer before the Imam, given that the Imam does not join the individual in that prayer. The main implication of this is when the Imam starts saying Allahu Akbar to begin the prayer, some people they say Allahu Akbar and they fold the hands before the Imam has finished the takbir tahrima. For such a person, the prayer has not even started. Person must be cautious that they are following the Imam, not reciting ahead of the Imam when it comes to the arkan of the salah. Why? Because if you miss the arkan, the prayer is invalid. And the last one, that is laughter during salah. And this was something which we discussed in good detail when looking at those things which nullify the wudu. There's three possible scenarios when it comes to laughing in the prayer. And this applies 
to laughing in a prayer with ruku and sujood for the reason we mentioned the story of the man who was blind or his eye was affected he couldn't see and he fell in the masjid and some people start laughing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said those of you who are laughing repeat your wudu and repeat your prayer so the jurists they infer from this that as well as the prayer breaking the wudu broke in that particular scenario as well and we looked at this particular story in good detail but in Dure Mukhtar it's mentioned that there's three particular scenarios for laughing number one is that you laugh such that there's a noise which comes out and if there was no other sound obstruction the person next to you would have been able to hear you laughing even if you're in a room completely on your own if you laugh to the extent you make a noise that if there was somebody next to you and it was completely quiet, they would hear you. This invalidates the wudu as well as the prayer. If you're praying and you laugh such that you heard the noise that comes from that laughter, but if somebody was stood right next to you, they wouldn't have been able to hear, then it's mentioned that this invalidates the prayer but not the wudu. And if you're laughing such that there's no noise whatsoever, no noise whatsoever, in other words, it makes you smile, but you don't actually make that laughing sound, then this does not invalidate the prayer or the wudu. So these are the three scenarios. Very, very important, especially for youngsters these days. You see in schools, it's very, very common. One kid is praying, another kid is trying to make him laugh. So it's important that we pass these masail on to our youth. And of course, we should encourage them and warn them of the dangers of disturbing people in the prayer. But what is the ruling? It's good to know that is, if somebody would have been able to hear you laugh if they were next to you, this breaks the wudu as well as the prayer. If a person was next to you, they wouldn't have been able to hear you, but you could have heard yourself. This breaks the prayer but not the wudu. And in the case there was no sound, this does not invalidate the prayer or the wudu. Forsaking the prayer. When a land is predominantly populated by Muslims and the ruling law is that of Islam, forsaking the prayer and publicly displaying this was considered a communal sin. The individual who abandons the obligatory prayer intentionally out of laziness and makes a public display of this was imprisoned and chastised. This treatment um, is repeated until either the person begins to pray or remains in that state. What a person does in the confines of his or her own home is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the authorities are not to interfere with their personal lives. In this paragraph it shows how highly the Salaf al-Salih held the Salah, that people would be punished for publicly missing the prayer. And the reward and the, of praying a Salah and the sin of missing a Salah is something we've covered already, alhamdulillah. When is it an obligation to discontinue your prayer? It's obligatory to terminate the prayer when there is someone in desperate need of help or in severe danger. In this case, some of the ulama, they say it's an obligation upon you to terminate your prayer. When is it permissible to discontinue the prayer? You don't have to, but you can. That is, if there is a thief stealing your property. So to go and regain that property or to stop it from being stolen, it's permissible to break the prayer. This brings us to the end of chapter 9. Tomorrow, inshallah, I want to mention a few things from chapter 10, a few things uh, in regards to those things which are makruh tahrimi during the prayer. Tomorrow, I had the intention to mention a few rulings regarding the moon sighting. Tomorrow after Maghrib, many people will be restless. Around this time, tomorrow people, will be, they'll be restless. Is it Eid on Friday or is it Saturday? And so a few of them, Masail, inshallah, have the intention to cover, as well as a few rulings about the Jama'ah. If Ramadan is on, fr uh, on Saturday, then there will be a short class on Friday also. Please all make the effort to attend. I just wanted to end just four or five minutes talking about a Mas'ala, which sadly, people don't give it the importance it deserves and that's the mas'ala regarding Sadaqatul Fitr. Sadaqatul Fitr is wajib to the extent that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith, Shahru Ramadana, uh, just a little side point, that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that your fasting, it will remain suspended in between the earth and the skies. But the side point that's just come to mind is that this particular concept of things being abandoned or suspended between the sky and the earth is something very common. 
And one thing in particular we should all take away, if you're going to take one thing away from this class today, then let it be what I'm about to mention. Every Muslim is in need of something. Every human being is in need of something. Some people are in more desperate need than others. Everybody is in need for dua. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he said, that inna du'a'a mawkufun bayna as-sama'i wal-ard. لا يسعد منه شيء حتى تصلي على حتى تصلي على نبيك صلى الله عليه وسلم. That when you make du'a, that du'a remains suspended in between the earth and the skies. None of that du'a is lifted to the court of Allah subhanahu wa taala until you send salam upon your Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم. And so we know there's certain things that increase chance of acceptance of du'a. And there's some things that decrease chances of acceptance of dua. One that's mentioned is qalbin ghafilin, the person whose heart is not present in the dua. You're making dua, but you don't even know what you're asking for. Just very quickly, you mutter a few words, rub your hands over your face and walk off. The chances of such a dua being accepted are quite low. A second reason is that a person makes dua for something that they need after a certain period of time, they say, I'm not going to get this. I've been making dua, I'm not getting it, forget about it. This is another reason the ulama mentioned for dua not being accepted. The third one, very big one, that is that the ulama mentioned and it's proven through hadith that a person who earns haram, a person who eats from haram income, such a person's chances of acceptance when it comes to dua heavily decreased. Heavily decreased. And when it comes to acceptance, Many, many different things are mentioned. For example, some of the ulama, they say, if you're in desperate need of something, give sadaqah before making dua. Why? Because when you give sadaqah, you are a focal point of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And so when you make dua, there's a higher chance of that dua being accepted. Similarly, because of this saying of Hazrat Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala an, that your dua is not raised until you send salat and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ulama, they say, Start your dua with the root sharif and end it with the root sharif. Why? Because if there's one thing that is guaranteed acceptance in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the root sharif. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all merciful. What's the chances that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept the beginning of your dua and the end, but not that which was in the middle? So this is something that we should all be aware of. Coming back to the hadith that I wanted to mention, that is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ مُعَلَّكُمْ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا يُرْفَعُ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا بِزَكَاةِ الْفِتْرِ That your Ramadan, شَهْرُ Ramadan, your month of Ramadan and the ibadah and your fast, they will be suspended in between the earth and the skies. They will not be raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except with Sadaqatul Fitr. This is one of the most famous narrations when it comes to the importance of Sadaqatul Fitr. And Sadaqatul Fitr is wajib upon every free Muslim individual. Two things that need pointing out. Number one, that is, that it's wajib upon the free Muslim individual who owns the Nisab. What is the Nisab? The Nisab nowadays is slightly more complicated than it was in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Nisab was, firstly, the currency was according to gold and silver. This is the first thing. If a person owned 200 dirhams, 200 silver coins, more or above the hajat al-asliya, the basic necessities and the basic needs, then this would be Nisab. They would meet the threshold for zakat and sadaqatul fitr. Alternatively, if they owned 20 dinars, 20 golden coins above their basic necessity, then they would be considered as holding the nisab or being at the nisab, being at that threshold. Nowadays, the currency is not in gold and silver, number one, and the nisab values are different. In the time of the Prophet wasallam, the nisab of silver, the 200 dirhams, was approximately equivalent to the value of the 20 dinar. Nowadays, 20 dinar, which is around 87 grams of gold, is around 4,500 pounds in value. Approximately, not exactly, but around. Whereas the 200 dirhams, which is equivalent to around 612 grams of silver, is 
worth around 400 pounds, 380, 400 pounds, somewhere in that region. And so there's a big discrepancy. Which one should we use? The ulama, they say that you should use the one which is going to benefit the poor people more. Which one in this country is going to benefit the poor people more? The nisab of silver. Why? Because if you use the nisab of silver, then more people are going to give the sadaqatul fitr or the zakat, and so more poor people are going to benefit. So this is the fatawa or the fatwa of many of the ulama. They've been giving this fatwa for many years. That is better for you to go according to the nisab of silver in this country. More people will have to give in this manner. And so if you have this 380, 400 pounds more than your basic needs, then sadaqatul fitr is wajib upon you. And sadaqatul fitr is different to zakat. Why? Because for zakat, you need to have held that nisab for at least a year. When it comes to sadaqatul fitr, if you own that amount at the time of dawn on the day of Eid, then it's wajib upon you. So this is for the adult individual, the adult sane individual. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he was of the opinion that sadaqatul fitr is wajib even upon a person who is not balik and upon a person who is not sane. And so it's important that we understand what we do for those who are under our guardianship or those under our care. Let's take children as an example. Children who are not balig. Children who are not balig, they can fall into two categories when it comes to giving sadaqatul fitr. Either that child owns the nisab. Nowadays, a lot of kids have big savings because of child fund trusts and because of gifts given on Eid and so on and so forth. If the child does not own the zakat, newborn or a young kid, the majority of children will fall into this bracket. They do not own the nisab. If they do not own the nisab, then it's wajib upon the guardian, the father, to pay on behalf of that child. Wajib. The father is sinful for not paying on behalf of this child. If the child does own the nisab, some of the ulama actually go to the extent they say it would be better to take the wealth from that child's wealth. It would be better to take the sadaqatul fitr from the child's wealth if the child is malik of nisab, owner of the nisab. Some ulama they say that if the child is not balik and they own the nisab, then it's not you should take it, it's you can take it. But either way, the permissibility is there. If the child is balik, then there's one of two scenarios that are applicable. Either that child is under your care, and this is very common, that balik children are under the guardianship of their parents. Children become balik by 11, 12 at times. Islamically, once the child is 15 years of age, in lunar years, which is around 14 and a half years, according to the calendar we use, English calendar or solar calendar, once they're 14 and a half and above, they should be tra and treated as though they are balik, whether they've shown any signs of being balik or not. And so, when it comes to these children who are balik, but under guardianship of their parents, meaning their basic needs are being provided by their parents, food, clothes, bills, shelter, and so on and so forth, then the parent needs to give the sadaqa to fitr and there's no need to take permission of that particular individual. On the other hand, if you're going to give it on behalf of your child, but that child is not under your guardianship, meaning that child is responsible for their own expenses, they buy their own food, they buy their own clothes, they pay their own bills, then to pay on behalf of that child would only be valid if you've taken permission from that child of yours. If you've just given it on behalf of that child because that child is not practicing, you know that child is not going to give the sadaqatul fitr. Many parents do this. They'll just give it. They'll just give it on behalf of their balik children who are responsible of their own basic needs in life. They pay their own bills. They buy their own food, own clothes. This sadaqatul fitr would not be fulfilled. That wajib would not be lifted from that child. You would need to take permission from that child first. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and I'll end with this point said that sadaqatul fitr is wajib even upon the person who does not pray. This is proven from Quran and Sunnah that sadaqatul fitr is wajib upon the person who did not pray during Ramadan, did not fast during Ramadan. This is not a condition whether you prayed, whether you took Ramadan seriously or not, whether you fasted. Sadaqatul fitr is still wajib. Sadaqatul fitr can be given before Ramadan, uh, sorry, before Eid or after Eid. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if you give 
the sadaqat al fitr before the day of Eid, it will be accepted as a zakat. If you give it after the day of Eid, then it will be accepted as a sadaqah. What can we imply from this? Many scholars, they give the reference, like Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala, very famous muhaddith, he actually gives reference of many big ulama within the history of Islam, having said that the importance or virtue of a fard act, the reward of doing something which is fard, is 70 times greater than the reward of doing something which is nafal. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if you give the sadaqah al-fitr before Eid, it's accepted as zakat. Zakat is farz. If you give it after Eid, then it's accepted as a sadaqah, which is still rewarding. But from this you can imply that there's around 70 times more reward on giving it before Eid than after Eid. Whether it's 70 times or more, Allahu A'lam, but it's absolutely clear that there's more reward and there's more preference in giving it before Eid. Two things to note. Number one, that is, why should you give it before Eid? The Prophet ﷺ said that when you give Sadaqah al-Fitr, there's two major virtues of it. Number one, it acts as an expiation for any useless or obscene talk that you did whilst you were fasting. And number two, it gives food to the poor. These are the two biggest virtues of Sadaqah al-Fitr. If a person hasn't given Sadaqah al-Fitr in their life, they can still give Sadaqah al-Fitr for the years they've missed. And so those of us who have been negligent towards the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or if we know people who were negligent, whilst Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has still given us life to rectify our mistakes and fulfill those obligations upon us, we make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq to do so. Indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved Rasul know best. Wa akhiru da'waya an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillah rahman rahim Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina wa Ashabi Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa Barik wa Sallim wa Salli alayh Allahumma taqabbal minna innaka anta al-Sami'u al-Alim wa tuba alayna innaka anta al-Tawwabu al-Rahim inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina wa Ashabi Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa Barik wa Sallim wa Salli alayh سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين رمضان تجلى